beautiful. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigured you and me as he died to make men holy. Let us live. Would you remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. How, Assembly of God, would you give all of our servicemen a round of applause and thank them for their service.
morning. Let's sing America the Beautiful. Folks, I love these songs and I love this country. Amen.
to be reading a text out of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and we will begin with verse number 16. Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. The Apostle Paul is writing here, and he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who was blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. With this morning being Sunday, July the 4th, 2021, I felt impressed to the Holy Spirit to preach a message on the topic of God and country. And reading through this passage of Scripture, you may be wondering, well, how can we tie this in to a patriotic message? Well, with today being Independence Day, we celebrate the freedoms that we have as Americans. 
but sadly many of our original freedoms are being removed and they're being replaced by a freedom to do the things that are unspeakable. And as a result of these new so-called freedoms, it is costing us our original freedom that we as Christians have in the United States of America. All throughout history, every time a nation turned its back on God, God poured out his judgment upon that nation. And so in a sense, you could say that the blessing of God was withdrawn from that nation and the restraining power of the Holy Spirit had abandoned that nation. So this morning I want to preach to you on the subject and I'm calling the title of this message, When a Nation is Abandoned by God. Would you lift your hands toward heaven and let's pray and ask for God's strength in this service. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Father, for every promise that's written in your word. And Father, I pray that in this message this morning, God, that you would speak to our hearts, that our lives would be changed. Lord, I pray that you would speak into our spirit, the infallible, inerrant, ever-living seed of the word of God. And Lord, we will give you praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. I am proud to be an American, and I am proud to be Pentecostal. As an American, we respect our flag. I said, as an American, we respect our flag. And the men and women who died, that that flag may continue to wave. But there are those in our nation today who want to experience another abundance of freedom. They want the freedom to do whatever they please. They want a freedom to do whatever they want to do and be whatever they want to be. They want to have freedom to do things that laws were once prohibiting. They want to experience an abundance of freedom, but yet they have no idea how that real freedom came into existence. And as a result, those people do not have any respect for our flag. This banner that flies over our schools, churches, and government buildings that represents our freedom in the United States of America. On this flag, you have 50 stars that are located in a field of blue to represent 50 states that are united together to form one unified nation. We have 13 stripes on this flag, which represents the 13 original British colonies so that we do not forget throughout the generations of time where we came from neglecting our historical heritage. You have the red stripes which also represent the hardiness, the valor and the bloodshed that was given by men and women throughout the generations who have paid the ultimate price for freedom by giving their own lives, defending this nation. You have the white stripes which signifies purity and innocence that we as a nation should be united together as one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. As an American, we are blessed people to be experiencing the freedom of religion. As I said earlier, I am proud to be a Christian. I am proud to be Pentecostal. I am proud to serve as a pastor in the assemblies of God. Here in the United States, we are blessed with the freedom to preach the message of the Word of God. And just as the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as long as I still have the breath of life in my soul, I will preach this never changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It may become against the law. If that's the case, then so be it. You can lock me up in prison, but I will declare to this world there is a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We are a blessed nation. We have Bibles in almost every household across this great nation. We are blessed to be able to come together and to worship God. And as long as freedom rings, and even beyond that, we as a church, we must continue to preach the glorious gospel message of Jesus Christ. We must preach the message of the cross of Calvary, that without the shedding of his blood, there is no remission of sin. We're going to preach the message of Pentecost. We're going to preach the four, the four fold gospel.
gospel message that Jesus saves, that Jesus heals, that Jesus baptizes in the Holy Ghost, and that Jesus Christ is coming again. You see, this gospel message, it is the power of God unto salvation. And this gospel message is for everyone. This gospel message is for everyone. That means we preach the gospel to the black people. That means we preach the gospel message to the white people. We preach this message to the Native Americans. We preach this message to the Hispanics. We preach this message to the Asians. Whoever in this world is in possession of the very breath of life from God Almighty, that's who this gospel message is for. You see, this message is for all nations. This message is for all languages. This message is for the rich. This message is for the poor. This message is for the young. And this message is for the old. This message is for every male and female. And by the way, that's all there is living in this world. God only created a male and a female. And there is absolutely nothing else that exists. See, God is not willing that anyone perish in their sins, but that they would all come to repentance. God does not want a single soul to die and go to hell. It was not his desire in the beginning. You see, God did not make hell for mankind, but he made hell for Lucifer and the fallen angels. And so God has prepared the way for salvation for those who have faith in God. And there is only one way to salvation. Buddha cannot save you. Muhammad cannot save you. Hinduism cannot save you. There is only one name that can bring salvation. Jesus said, I am the way. He said, I am the truth. He said, I am the life. No man comes to salvation. No man can come to the Father. No man can come unto God except in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 4 and 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we can be saved. You see, salvation is not by works. You cannot earn salvation. But salvation is by faith in the name of Jesus, regardless of what the teachings of man may say. There was some time ago, Years ago, 1,500 years ago or so, in the Catholic Church, during what history calls the Dark Ages, it was during this time that the Word of God was translated entirely into the Latin language. During this time, all other copies of the Word of God, every language, all the German Bibles, any English Bibles, Italian Bible, everything was burned and destroyed, removed out of the homes of the child of God. Only the scriptures could be read and printed in the Latin language. The Catholic Church had removed the Bible out of the home. And as a result of the scriptures being taken away, and as a result of people not knowing what the Word of God said, they had absolutely no idea how to live for God. And it was also during this time, 1,500 years ago, that the religion of Islam began to come into existence. The church began to monetize on people's salvation experience. They began to promote pagan rituals and ideas to be carried out in the church. It was taught that salvation could be earned. It was also taught that salvation could be gained by good works. It was not until a, a cardinal by the name of Martin Luther wrote a letter called the 95 Thesis and had it posted to the door of the Catholic Pope, and he said, no, sir, it is written in Romans 1 that the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. There are people today that serve in churches all over this world. They are trying to dumb down this gospel message. They are promoting false teachings that say that you can live any way that you want to live and still make it to heaven. They say that you can do whatever you want to do because there is no hell. They think we all end up in heaven. But I've got news for those people that say anything can go because I firmly believe God has a special 
special place in hell for those who have led God's people astray to those who have neglected to preach the word of God to preach the whole truth and nothing but the truth we must stand on the word of God it is our ultimate authority it is the word of God that we're going to be judged by on judgment day I'm not going to stand by the supreme court I'm not going to stand in front of the laws of this land but I am going to stand before God if I have failed mankind it's one thing but if I have pleased God almighty if I have been obedient to his word if I have lived according to this book that is all that matters and if we have pleased God that means all is well within our soul you can have all this world has to offer you can have all the government powers of this world but as Joshua said as for me and my house we will serve the Lord we're going to serve him with all of our heart with all of our soul with all of our mind we're not going to bend to this world we're not going to cave in to the enemy but we're going to be victorious in Jesus name in Jesus name God never turns his eye against sin he sees every bit of it he knows about everything that takes place every one of us this morning under the sound of my voice whether here or watching online at some point in time in your life you have sinned and have gone against God's plan the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 verse 23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God that sin comes with a great price. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We also see in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. In the New Living Translation it says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Think about that for just a second. The wrath of God. It's a subject nobody wants to hear about. It's a subject nobody wants to hear about in the church. We try to find a church that, that pleases the desires of our flesh, that, that they will tell us that we can live any way that we want to live, that we can just be who we are, and we can live our best life now and discover the champion in our life. And, and there is a pastor that pastors one of the largest church in the United States of America. He says, God never looks at what's wrong in your life. He always looks at what's right. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. See, the subject of the wrath of God is not a popular subject, but it is a critical and central subject when we're wanting to have a clear understanding of the gospel message. It's the wrath of God. See, there's a number of different aspects to the wrath of God, but I want us to have our attention called to the, the wrath that is presented in Romans chapter 1, and that is the wrath of abandonment the wrath of abandonment. You see, it is that wrath that is exhibited by God when he turns his back on a society. To the nation of Israel, God said in Judges chapter 10, verse 13 through 14, God said, Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. What God was telling the Israelites, he was telling them, You have disobeyed me over and over, and now I'm finished with you. You have committed adultery with pagan deities. You have worshipped other idols. You have been disobedient to my word. And so as a result, God was saying, I'm not going to protect you any longer. He said, you're on your own. You can go after those false gods that you've been worshipping. You can go to those deities that you've been bound before and see if they're going to help you in your time of trouble. You can call out to those statues. You can call out to those wooden images. They're not going to do a single thing except rot and crumble before your face before they ever do a single thing to help you out. In Proverbs chapter 1, 
verse 24 through 31, we find a similar statement. In the New Living, it says, But since you refuse to listen when I call, and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, since you disregard all my advice and do not accept my rebuke, I in return will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you. Then they will call unto me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurned my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. God is serious when it comes to disobedience to his word. Concerning the Pharisees, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 14, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Church, there is no excuse for people today having ungodly behavior because God's commandment has been given to us in God's word. Almost every household in this nation has a copy of the word of God. And I wish to God sometimes that we would dust off that Bible and open it up and begin to read it and digest it and learn from what God has told us and live according to his word and worship him in spirit and in truth. See, it is a principle that we see throughout the Word of God that when we are obedient to God's Word, that we're going to experience the blessings of God. However, when people are disobedient to God's Word, they experience the cursing of God. Obedience leads to God's blessing. Disobedience leads to God's cursing. See, there's a lot of people in this world that may have heard about God. They may know of God, but they do not know Him. And they do not glorify Him as God. For example, they may go to church sometimes on Sunday, and then they go to the bar throughout the week. They may sing in the choir on Sunday morning, and then they sing at the bar, singing karaoke all week long. They may go to the church and give in the offering, or then they may not give in the offering because they say, I cannot afford it. But then on Monday, they spend every last penny at the casino. They may talk like a holy roller on Sunday morning, and by Monday morning, they've committed mass murder by their hateful words. See, people have become vain in their imaginations. Their godly lifestyle is only in their imagination. And in the reality, they have no covenant relationship with Jesus Christ because they never truly repented of their sin. They're just a practicing religious person who does not know God. They may pray a little here and a little there. They may know a few scriptures, but they keep living the same old life that they were living before. They're halfway in and halfway out and committed absolutely to nothing. See, we need to understand that turns God's stomach. We need to understand that makes God sick for someone that he has created in his perfect image and likeness, who he has breathed into their nostrils, the very breath of life, to have a pretentious relationship with him. It upsets God to the point that he says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3 verse 15 through 16, he said I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I don't know about you, but every morning when I drink my four to five cups of coffee, I either want to drink it boiling hot where it burns my tongue, or I want to drink it icy, slushy, cold with syrup and tons of sugar and all kinds of flavors in it because that's the way I like it. I either want it hot or I want it cold. I made a terrible mistake one day. I was at home on a Saturday afternoon. I was preparing a message to preach on Sunday. And I have a collection of all my coffee cups there that I've been drinking on throughout the week until I do my daily dishwashing cycle, whether I need it or not. And I was drinking, I was studying, and I was so engrossed in what I was typing on the computer, I picked up the wrong coffee cup. 
I took a sip of it, made the biggest mess on my desk. I spewed it right out. My body rejected it because it wasn't hot and it wasn't cold. It's room temperature and God only knows how long it's been sitting there. But my body rejected it. Let me tell you something, church. The church is the body of Christ. And if you're not hot, and if you're not cold, you're going to be rejected from that body. You're going to be rejected from that body. He either wants you totally committed for him or he doesn't want you at all. He doesn't want you to be halfway in and halfway out. But he says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Today, when you're looking at the church world and you're looking at what's taking place in our nation with laws and governing authorities and businesses, no longer is there an acceptance of an absolute truth. Anymore, it seems that whatever the majority wants, whatever the majority says so, that's what becomes known as the truth. Sometimes people only accept a statement as true based upon a particular person's political affiliation. I heard a story some time ago that there was a, a young boy who was having trouble with his math homework. First, he called up his pastor and he said, Pastor, I'm having difficulty and, and I need to know how much is 12 times 12. And the pastor looked at the boy and said, Son, 12 times 12 is 144. And the boy said, Pastor, is that common core math? The pastor said, No, son, that's called multiplication. And the boy said, You're full of too much religion. I'm going to look for my answer in science. I want to find out the real facts in science. And so the boy goes to see a scientist, and, and the scientist says, well, by the course of elimination, 12 plus 12, and according to the, the 12 times 12, and according to the results of the experimentation, and based on the data that you have presented, son, it is a scientific law and a fact that 12 times 12 is 144. Well... We know we're living in the 21st century. We no longer want to listen to what the pastor says, and now it seems that we don't want to listen to what real science says. And so the boy decides, well, I want to go talk to that person that's running for political office. And he goes and talks to this candidate, and I don't think I have to tell you what political party he's affiliated with. But the boy said, sir, can you tell me how much is 12 times 12? And that political figure got down on one knee, held out his hand and had an ear-to-ear -ear smile and he said, son, 12 times 12, how much do you want it to be? How much do you want it to be? And church, that's exactly where we've come to in a nation. That's what we see taking place in the United States because we're, reject we're rejecting the truth that is being preached in our pulpits of our churches. We're rejecting the facts of what is found in real science and biology because it proves these liberals wrong all the time. And so we go to some government politician who hasn't got the sense that God gave a rabbit and they offer us whatever we want for free just so we vote for them and then we become confused we become lost we become disoriented because there's no longer any absolute truth and as a result anything goes and so they ask the question they ask the kids what restroom do you want to use what gender do you want to be do you want to work for money do you want to stay home and still get money do you want to sue your family go ahead you want to change your church doctrine to make it less offensive why not and that's what we're seeing take place in our world today. And now you have people who are professing themselves to be wise. You have people that are full of pride, but yet they're nothing but a bunch of fools. In recent times, humanity has exchanged something that is true for something that is fake. Man has found pleasure and uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. Man brings dishonor upon his own body through sin. And the truth of God's word is now called a lie. Scientific fact is no longer regarded because it still exposes the truth of those who want to live a life of perversion. Today, animals and plants now receive more respect than the life of an unborn baby. And today, our government authority loves to use your time tax dollars to murder millions of babies every year. Humanity 
Humanity has invented a new so-called genders that is nothing but manipulated by drug-induced hormones. Today you have people who are tiptoeing through the tulips. They're declaring to the world that they are a free woman when all they really are is just a mutilated, natural-born male. And likewise, at the same time, there are those who claim to be a man, but in the natural, they are a female. I remind you again, God only created two genders. He made them male and female. You're only born with one gender. It cannot be changed. Science proves that it cannot be changed because of the genetic makeup of the chromosomes and your DNA. You see, a male is born a male. All his life, he's going to be a male. And when he dies, he's still going to be a male. A man can have surgeries. He can have parts removed. He can have implants. He can take special drugs. He may look like a woman. He may smell like a woman. He may talk and, and, and dress like a woman. He may even use the woman's restroom. But when that person dies, years down the road, when all that's left is his dirty, rotten bones, science is going to scream louder than ever before. That DNA is going to say, this is a male. It is a male. A female is born a female. All of her life, she's a female. When she dies, she's still a female. She can have special surgeries. She can have all the reductions. She can cut off all her hair. She can look like a man, sound like a man, grow a beard like a man, dress like a man, and even use the men's restroom. But when that person dies, all that's left is just her DNA that says, this is a female. You cannot change what God has created. You cannot change what God has created. You see, there comes a time when enough is enough. You can only pull on a rubber band so long until it snaps. You can only whittle away on a piece of wood until there's nothing left, and then it's all gone. Romans chapter 1, verse 28 says, And even as they did not like to retain God and their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things which are not convenient. In the New Living it says, Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do the things that should never be done. So as a result, God abandoned them to do whatever they desire. His restraining power was taken away from them. They no longer had a desire to serve God. They no longer had a desire to live for Him. And it was evident, so God left them alone. You see, it's a frightening thing to think about that. It's frightening to think that a nation, a people, an individual may be abandoned by God. It's frightening to think that the opportunity for salvation is gone, that the day of grace was over. In Romans chapter 1, we see that this is very clear. When people constantly give in to sin, that God's restraining power abandons them. Take a look at our nation. Take a look at our world. Take a look at our government and what they're standing for. What's been the focus of our nation lately? If you've watched the news, what's been the focus of events in the last couple of weeks in northwest Arkansas? I, for one, take no pride in what I've been seeing. I take no pride in seeing people living the life of perversion. And so we see that it's pretty convincing that God is very soon, if not already, beginning to remove his restraining power from our nation. And as a result, anything is about to become possible. I firmly believe that the United States of America has reached a point to where God has just about had enough. You see, they no longer have respect for the church. They no longer have respect for the Word of God. There is no respect for the people of God. The world says you need to make the Christians be quiet. You've got to stop them from having the worship service, but yet the world still wants their entertainment. The world still goes to their sporting events and shops at their shopping malls. The world tells the church that you can't go to church and worship together in a large group because that's where people catch disease, but yet the world still fornicates. The 
The world still cheats on their spouse. The world says you can't read the Bible in public. You can't pray in public. But yet they still watch their dirty movies. They still look at filth on the internet. And they take pride in what they're doing. The world says you can't pray in public. That you can't quote scripture in public. But then they call us every curse word in the book. And they encourage others to take pride in and support what they want to do. They're going to burn our American flag. They're going to indoctrinate your children with evolution and the homosexual lifestyle. They'll teach children that they can be whatever gender they want to be, that they can use whatever restroom they want to use. But then they say, you can't send a Bible to school with your kid. But yet they'll give your children condoms. They'll teach your children how to have safe sex. You can't mention the name of Jesus. And so they have a double standard. They replace the Word of God with scientific theory and then denounce scientific fact when it comes to sexuality. And so as a result, the fake is revered as truth and the truth is called fiction. And sometimes we wonder, is there any hope? Is there any chance of this nation turning around? Is there any hope of the United States? Is there any hope for a society that's in this condition? Because when you look at the history of the world, it is a cycle that keeps happening over and over again. All throughout history, it has happened before in Israel. It's happening today in Israel. Many generations of the Jewish people, God's chosen people for a future redemption, many generations have gone through this cycle. They have rejected the one true God, and they spend all their time rationalizing about their condition. They're inventing some kind of complex religion and we're wondering, is there any hope for them in the future? Is there any hope for the United States of America? Is there any hope for any nation of this world? And so we look in Psalms chapter 81 verse 11 in the New Living Translation, the Lord says, but no, my people would not listen. Israel did not want me around. In Romans chapter 1, we see when that happens that God gives them over to a reprobate mind. He, he lets them go. But then we hear a heart's cry from God Almighty. We hear one more plea from God in Psalm 81, verse 13 through 16. God says, oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that Israel would follow me walking in my paths. How quickly I would then subdue their enemies. How soon my hands would be upon their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him. They would be doomed forever. But I would feed you with the finest wheat. I would satisfy you with wild honey from the rock. Church, today God is trying to get our nation's attention one more time. He is calling out from the throne room of heaven. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that they would walk in my way. And if, nation, if nations around this world will begin to call on the name of the Lord and begin to seek first his ways, seek first his kingdom, then God is going to turn away from abandoning them. He is going to turn away from giving them over to their own sinful desires. He is again going to defend and to protect them from their enemies. But the key to it all, the key to God's blessing, the key to the mercy of God continuing in our life and in our nation is to walk in God's ways, to be obedient to his word. The only hope for this nation, for any nation, for any society or people is to hear the word of the Lord and obey it. See, we are living in an hour when we do not need weak people preaching weak messages in weak churches, but we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost to be so real more than ever before that the message of repentance will be preached, that people will not care if they offend someone who walks in off the street, but that we preach the uncompromised Word of God with power and authority under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that the convicting power of God will move across our communities, will change people's lives, that people will will get so uncomfortable until they give their life to Jesus Christ and this nation can be turned upside down one more time if God's people would just get before an altar and humble themselves and pray and say God we need your grace God we need your direction we need you God to guide us to direct us in the name of Jesus in 2nd Chronicles chapter 7 verse 13 through 14 the Bible says if I shut up heaven that there be no rain or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. 
if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The only hope that we have is Jesus. The only real peace is found in Jesus Christ. Without him, we're not going to make it. If we turn our back on him, he's going to remove his blessing from our lives, from our society, from our people. But if we will walk with God, if we will be obedient to his word, seek first his kingdom, God will bless us. He will bring revival once again if we will just trust in him and be obedient to his word. Can we stand together across the sanctuary? Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. God, that you have blessed us, dear Father, more than we could ever deserve. Lord, you have blessed us to be a part of this great church here at Howe Assembly of God, a great community in eastern Oklahoma, a church where people can come from all over this region, from Arkansas and Oklahoma, a place where people can tune in and watch from anywhere in this world, where we can worship you together in spirit and in truth. Father, I pray that you would search our hearts anything in our life, God, that would keep us out of your will. Father, we pray for your forgiveness. God, that you would strengthen us. God, that you would create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. God, we cannot make it off of the desires of the flesh. We cannot make it off of our own strength, out of our own resources. For your word says it's not by mind nor by power but by your spirit, in Jesus' name. Father, every need that's represented in this church, God, we know that you are able. Lord, you're still the healer. You're still the savior. You're still our Lord, our master, and our king. And Lord, we're gonna stand on your word. For in the time of trouble, your word is a solid foundation. In the time of trouble, in the time of weakness, you give us strength. For Lord, your word says that you're able to do exceeding and abundant above all that we could ever ask of you. Lord, we thank you 